All right, praise the Lord, saints. We're thankful for another day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. God has given us another day to praise him. He has given us another day of life, health, and strength, and we're thankful for it. So at this time, we're going to go before the Lord in prayer and invite his presence into this place. Father God, we're thankful for this day, another beautiful day that you have made, God. We thank you for life. We thank you for another opportunity to praise you, God. We thank you for all the blessings that you have blessed us with. We thank you for sustenance. We thank you for provision. We thank you for health, God. We thank you for protecting us, God, from all the dangers seen and unseen, Lord. We just want to give your name glory and praise on today. Lord, we pray for our loved ones right now, friends and family that are hurting, God. Lord, we pray that you would touch them right now in the name of Jesus, God. Any spirit of depression, God, any spirit of discouragement, God, we come against it right now in the name of Jesus. We cast those spirits out, Lord God. Lord, we deny and we reject anything that it tries to exalt itself over the knowledge of you, O oh God. So, Lord, we just want to give you glory, we want to give you honor and praise, God. And, Lord, may your word uplift your people and empower them, God, for this fight of the spiritual warfare, God. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we thank God for everyone that's tuned in today. Once again, we're here at Sunday School where the learning never stops. And we're thankful that you decided to tune in today. And we're thankful for everyone jumping on today. Um, usually I was using another program, but that pro program did not want to cooperate today. And so we're um, back on our regular format. So first and foremost, I want to give honor to God who is the head of my life, my Savior. In him, I trust and he's my provider. And uh, I have a lot to be thankful for. I'm thankful that he's given me life and another opportunity to speak to you today. I want to give honor to my bishop, the Bishop J. Drew Sheard, who is the presiding bishop of Michigan North Central. We thank God for him, and we're praying for him. I'm thankful for my pastor, Pastor John Hall Jr., who is the pastor of Rehoboth International Ministries in Warren, Michigan. I also want to give honor to Elect Lady Hall, who is the elect lady there. I want to also greet my cousin, Pastor Mark Went, who is the pastor of El Shaddai Prophetic Deliverance Ministries in Spanish Town, Jamaica. He usually jumps on here, and I'm thankful that he takes the time and he does that. And he has a very powerful ministry there on the island of Jamaica. True man of God, I'm thankful for him and his ministry. I also want to give uh, honor and thanks to Sister Brenda Howard. She's one of my main people. She assists me from time to time and teaches Sunday school. I also want to give honor to my main man, uh, Minister James Foster III. He's been a blessing. That's like my partner in the ministry. And so um, we have two little prophets of doom going out there <laughs> saying stuff. No, I'm just joking. But I also want to thank all you people of God, uh, Rehoboth International Ministries family. I see you and God bless you. I love you all. And all the people of God, you know, we are, we're to love one another. It doesn't matter what church you go to, what denomination we may claim. Those are just titles of men and groupings of men. But the family of God is the family of God. So you're all my brothers and sisters today. Now, Psalm 113, Psalm 113, it says, From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. So guess what? We always have to be thankful for what God has given us. We always have to be thankful for the things that come our way. Uh, the scripture also declares to us in all things where to give thanks. You know, sometimes it's hard, but we could, you know, we could be going through a worse situation. God has been merciful to us. We have to make a choice to rejoice. You know, um, back before the pandemic, uh, we could know what kind of day we had. We could set the atmosphere. And uh, as Pastor John Hall would like to, he would like to share with us, you know, you can either be one of two things. Do you want to be a thermostat or a thermometer? Well, you might question, well, what do you mean by that? Well, what Pastor meant by that, you know, what I'm going to convey what um, I mean by that, what Pastor has shared and has been a blessing is that um, when you go into a room, the thermostat sets the temperature. The thermostat sets the atmosphere, whereas the thermometer just says, oh, this is the atmosphere. 
So the way that you determine that your day is going to begin, that's how it sh that's how it should go. So if you wake up praising God, you're going to have a good day. So I make it a point every time as soon as my eyes open up. Thank you, Lord. And so I have a good attitude because God is still on the throne. So we have a lot to be thankful for today. Now, my question is, as we watch the news, my question is, do these people know the future? You know, it seems that we are living our lives on what I consider false prophecy because they're going to tell you, oh, this can happen, that can happen. They don't know the future. Only God knows the future. And so I put my trust in him. You know, they talk about, oh, the food shortage, all this and that. Um, when I looked into what the food shortage was, they were actually talking about they had to kill animals. They had to throw stuff away. That shows me that God has blessed us so much that we don't even have room to contain it. Come on now. Y'all don't even want to have church with me today, but that's okay. Now, in the book of Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, they were in a dark time. I've shared before, it's one of my favorite portions of scripture. And so as we look at our situation, we may say, man, I'm in a dark time. But what did Paul and Silas do? First thing they did was they prayed. The next thing they did was they sang praises unto God. And so in our dark time, what do we have to do? We have to pray and we have to sing praises unto God. So we pray, you know, we make things right. We confess our sins. God, I'm giving this all to you because we can't bear all these burdens. We have to turn our burdens over to the Lord. And when we turn our burdens over to him, we don't have to bear it anymore. So I turn it over to Jesus. He's going to work it out. And so scripture also declares to us that it's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. And so it's not in man's might, not in man's ability, but it's going to take God. And so we put our trust in him. Now, in last week's lesson, we looked at the topic of peace and justice reign, and that came from the book of uh, Zechariah chapter 8. We talked about how that God allowed the Jews to go uh, into captivity to learn a lesson. And so the people of Israel, many times they had a, a Achilles heel to idolatry. They would look and see what the other nations were doing. They wanted to be like the other nations a lot of times. God would warn them. He would tell them not to you know, uh, at the beginning, when we look around the book of Genesis, God always gave a directive not to take wives from other lands because of their practices. Even as we fast forward and we look at King Solomon, who was King David's son, that uh, he had uh, 700, 300 wives, 700 wives, 300 concubines. And so um, those women caused him to err from the, from the, 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 the worship of God, and that's where uh, a lot of times God's people were punished because of idolatry. So God allowed them to go into the captivity so they would learn not to be idolatry, so that they, he would remind them, you should know who the Lord your God is. And it's the same thing with us. As we look at all these things that they're prophesying doom and gloom, and as we see things going down, we think, see things, a lot, of shut, uh, a lot of things shut down, it should remind us. Um, in man's ability, things, you know, things are going to fail, but in God, he'll still take care of you. You can lose your job and God can still make income come in. You can lose your, your sustenance and God can still feed you. So uh, we're not to look to um, false gods. We have set up things before God and we've allowed these things to become our God, but God is the one that is our provision. Now, Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And so God punished them to bring forth righteousness. God is going to punish us to bring forth righteousness. He's going to teach us lessons so we know to be righteous. Uh, scripture declares unto us that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Not that Jesus was disobedient, but God, even God, through his, uh, through Jesus, through his earthly ministry, his father was going to teach him there were certain things that he had to go through to be, to continue on in the will of God. Now, God goes us, uh, God allows us to go through certain things to bring forth certain results. 
And there's sometimes we as parents allow our children to go through certain things so that they can learn. They may ask us for help, but there are also times that we say, you know what, I'm going to step back and let them go through that so that they can learn a lesson. That's what exactly what God does to us. And the question I like to ask a lot of times is where do we get that from? God actually imparts that into us because he does the same thing. Now, as we looked at these past Sunday school lessons, if you notice that the, the lessons, they've been kind of hovering over the same thing, and that is the captivity. So when we talked about Esther, there was they that remained behind in the land of Persia after the captivity. Then we talked about Zechariah and Zephaniah, how the people came back to rebuild or that they were warned that they were going to go into the captivity, but when they came back, that they would be able to rebuild. And so here we are in the book of Jeremiah. If we looked at those minor prophets, so to speak, they were basically different perspectives to kind of give you a picture, a different picture from each perspective of what was going on around the same time. So Jeremiah, he is known as the weeping prophet. And from him, we have 52 chapters. Um, so in the book of Jeremiah, we have 52 chapters. And then Jeremiah also wrote the book of Lamentations, and that has five chapters. And he was called by God at a young age. And he actually even used his age to um, be an excuse to not follow his call. And so when he finally yielded to that call, the people that he prophesied to were stiff-necked. They even complained about it, like, God, these people aren't even listening to me. And they rejected his words. And then one of the fo most famous lines of scripture we, we find from Jeremiah is in chapter 20 and verse 9. And it says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his words was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was very weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. So Jeremiah was saying, these people aren't listening. I'm not, God, I'm not even going to talk in your name anymore. I'm not going to listen anymore. And so what, what happened? What The word of God was like a burning fire. And so we get that phrase. It's like, just like fire shut up in my bones. And so the word of God, we can't even contain it. You know, we can say, oh, we're not going to say this. We're not going to say that. But when you have the spirit of God with you, there's going to be opportunities, going to be times where the word of God, you, you're not going to be able to hold it back. And so you just let it out. It has to come out, you know. And, and so Jeremiah is saying, I couldn't even hold it within myself. It had to come out. Now, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so the word of God is our weapon against falsehood. Our, the word of God is the weapon against false prophecy. When they're prophesying that there's going to be food shortages, there's going, there's the word of God says that Jehovah Jireh, he's my provider. The word of God shows us that he could feed us. He could have a raven. He could have ravens come and feed you if need be. So the word of God is our weapon against falsehood. Now we're going to go into our scripture reading and that's coming from Jeremiah 21 verses 8 through 14. I'm going to read it expeditiously. And unto this people thou shalt say, thus saith the Lord. Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He that abideth in this city shall die by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. But he that goeth out and falleth to the Chaldeans that besiege you, he shall live and his life shall be unto him for a prey. For I have set my face against this city for evil and not for good, saith the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. And touching the house of the king of Judah, say, Hear ye the word of the Lord. O house of David, thus saith the Lord, execute judgment in the morning, and deliver him that is spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor. Lest my fury go out like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Behold, I am against you, O inhabitants of the valley and rock of the plain, saith the Lord, which say, Who shall come down against us, or who shall enter into our habitations? 
But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will kindle a fire in the forest thereof, and it shall devour all things round about it. Now, in this setting, Jeremiah was prophesying. Now, let me go to the Bible truth. God judges his people for their continued disobedience and refusal to practice justice. And the lesson name says, by the end of the lesson, we will discover divine justice described by Jeremiah. Express gratitude that God is a God of justice and endeavor to be just an advocate for justice. So in this setting, Jeremiah, he is prophesying to Judah and Judah was what we consider the, the southern kingdom. So uh, the nation of Israel, they were broken into two kingdoms after the death of Solomon and they end up having two different kings. And so Israel was considered the northern kingdom. Judah was considered the southern kingdom. So Jeremiah is prophesying to the southern kingdom, which is in Judah. And at this time, King Nebuchadnezzar was positioned to overtake Jerusalem. And so this was the event that was going to lead them into the captivity. The, the, the city was besieged or it, it was surrounded by the enemy of the Babylonians. And so as we look at verses 8 through 9, it says, Unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He that abideth in the city shall die by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. And he that goeth out and falleth to the Chaldeans that besiege you, he shall live, and his life shall be unto him for a prey. So God gives the people two choices. He says, you, either have, gonna, you have an opportunity to choose life or you have an opportunity to choose death. Now, God still gives us choices today. You know, the word declares that the wages of sin is death. So God shows us, and he tells us, if you decide to live in the way of sin, that death will be your reward. Death will be your punishment. Think about the people that, quote unquote, live the fast life. Think about people that deal drugs. A lot of times they die young because they have chosen the way of sin. They have chosen a, a lifestyle that puts them at risk, a lifestyle that puts them at danger. And so uh, we, if we continue in a life of sin, if we continually go against the word of the Lord, we are in danger. We are saying to our soul that I don't care about my soul. I don't care about the life to come. I just care about this life. See, in, in the world of sin, this is their reward. This is their heaven. A lot of people are complaining about being shut in because they, they want to go back to the bar. They want to go back to the strip club. You know, they want to go back to all of these things which are against the word of God. But um, if we choose life, now Jesus said, I am the way. See, we have to choose Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, see, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And so God has always given man two uh, options, either the way of death or the way of life. So uh, he said that they that remain in the city will die one of three ways. He said by the sword, which means war, that they were going to have to fight. The other one was famine, which meant lack of food or lack of rain for provision. So even though the city was surrounded, they might say, well, we're just going to wake the Babylonians out. But their provisions would have ran out, so famine was going to come in. And he also said pestilence, which means diseases or plagues. And so uh, these things were promised, these three things were promised back in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that if the people did not remain loyal to the Lord, that this is what would befall him. And so God is not a man that he should lie. And so he, uh, what he promised to them was going to come to pass. Now, there are people that are more loyal to political parties than they are to God. You know, a lot of times the first thing out of their mouth, politician that, Democrat this, Republican that, uh, we have to be more loyal to God than we are to a party. I'm not saying not to be uh, a patriot, so to speak, but uh, we're to be Christians first. You know, a lot of what I see on Facebook is we're fleshly first, we're politicians first, but let's be Christians first. Let's be children of God first. You know, we have people fighting the government instead of surrendering to God. You know, they, is that what God called us to do? Did God call us to go uh, protest with weapons on a, on, a, on a government official steps? I don't think he called us to do that. You know, but God said that he that goeth out and falleth to the Chaldeans, he said, you shall live. 
So the people, they were going to lose their freedom, but they were going to save their lives. <laughs> now think about that. The people, now that's what people complain about nowadays. Oh, I, I lost my freedom, this and that. You lost your freedom, so to speak, but you have your life. And that's what, is, what, that's what this is all about. And when I was looking at this lesson, I was like, God, where are you trying to go with this? How, does, how um, can I convey that this applies to what is going on today? And there it was that they lost their freedom. We lost the ability to go around and do whatever we want, when we want it, but we have our lives. And so um, God has put these governors there to help protect people and to protect their lives. So God knows what he is doing, and the word of God never fails. Whenever you look in there, there is something in there that's for, that's for each and every one of us. So um, in verse 10, um, so where it says, and his life shall be unto him as a prey, means that your life was your reward. And so if someone robbed you with a gun, and then you were able to walk away, they took your possessions, but you were, you were able to walk away with your life, then you won you know, you can say, well, they got this, they got that, but your life is your reward. And so that's what God was saying. God was saying, even though the city is going to be destroyed, all of these things are going to going to happen. You're going to go into captivity, but you actually win because you, you have survived with your life. And so verse 10, he says, for I have set my face against the city for evil and not for good, saith the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall burn it with fire. So God already determined that the out, what the outcome was going to be, but he gave them a choice. So um, with us, we usually take the option that's more comfortable. So we're we're gonna whatever the easiest way out, whatever the whatever less pain is, you know that's the way that we take. And the word of God declares to us that some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. And so, uh, whereas people trust in the United States economy, where people trust in their job, but we have to trust in the Lord our God because because when those things go away. What are we supposed to trust in? We should have already been trusting in God. You know, uh, our, our resources may go away, but we have to look to the source, not the resources. We have to look to the source. So in these people trusted in the security of the city. But God said, if you do that, you're going to die. And so um, same thing with us. If we trust in all of these things, um, they're going to leave us high and dry, but we have to trust in God. You know, we, we have to chase after God. We have to diligently seek him and he will reward us. The word of God declares to us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things. And then what are they? Things, they're just things. We're seeking after relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verses 11 through 12 says, And touching the house of the king of Judah, say, Hear ye the word of the Lord. O house of David, thus saith the Lord, execute judgment in the morning and deliver him that is spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor. Lest my fury go out like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. So uh, this is the equivalent of saying, um, you know, Mr. President, you need to listen to what God says. Lawmakers do the right thing. Follow after justice. Stand up for the little guy when he is taken care of. So that was uh, the main thing that God was punishing them for was for injustice, was the things that they have allowed to happen to those that were less fortunate than everyone else. You know, they, they were not, uh, they were having the feast days, but they were not uh, fully celebrating or fully implementing the years of Jubilee, which was to relieve the debt, which was to give the people a break. And so God decided to punish them, you know, and they were to follow justice every day, not just every once in a while. And that's what's happened in our society. It's like there's so much injustice now that when justice does happen, it's almost like a treat, you know, like, like they just, here, here's a Scooby snack for you, <laughs> you know, but most of the time it's like, oh Lord, Lord, what, how, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. You know, and so it's the same thing that was happening in Israel. The people that were oppressed, the people that were poor, it's like, man, where, where's the year of Jubilee at? Where's the, where's the forgiveness at? You know, we, have a, we as a society have become the same way. And it's not fair for Israel to go in captivity and be punished 
where we walk away scot free. You know, in this in this country, um, special interests have a say so because of money. They they pay money to lawmakers, and so we see things come into action that should not be. Why? Because of the love of money, and the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, don't misquote it. It's not that money is evil, but the drive that makes people go after it by any means necessary. You know, uh, let let somebody die. Uh, let let somebody die with money and see what happens. People are gonna be fighting. They're gonna be fighting. They'll turn against you know uh, mother, mother against son, on and on and on, uh, brother against sister. You know, um, all of these things that we've seen. You know, we 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 we've seen it happen. But money, that love of money is the root of all evil. You know, justice goes out the door. You know, they, they pay off judges. They pay off jury people. All of these things to what? To, to bear false record. And so people have went to jail for, for decades. Why? Because money, because they lied, they weren't truthful. And so God was saying, you have to institute justice. You have to do those things that are right. You know, um, there's also, uh, we as we look at it carnally and money, there's also spiritual bribery. You know, uh, as, as ministers, as preachers of the gospel, teachers of the gospel, we're not to sugarcoat the gospel. A lot of people, they would sugarcoat the gospel as not to run people off. But, you know, as some moms will say, I'm not your little friend, <laughs> you know, uh, when when a preacher gets up in the pulpit, they don't have any friends because they have to execute the word of God. They have to execute justice. And there there were things that when I got in the pulpit, I didn't want to say, but I had to say them because I don't like being convicted every day, all day. Y'all, y'all, there's some people that that can stand conviction. I don't like being at odds with God. I don't like that 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 feeling in my stomach, like you know, God is just constantly on me. So I there are things that I have to say. I don't want to say, but I have to because it's the word of the Lord. And so um, spiritual bribery, you know, spiritual bribery is, oh, don't say the hard things. Don't don't tell the truth. But we have to tell the truth. We have to institute justice. So the time frame that Hosea and Amos prophesied, they spake about the injustice of the poor, how that the wealthy would take advantage of them. Same thing happens in this country. Um, so here in this setting, uh, it was about, 200 years after that. So where those prophets had prophesied, they were talking about, hey, we need to clean up. We need to clean our act up. We need to put things in order. 200 years later, the same thing was happening. So they did not listen. They did not learn a lesson. So God said, you know, don't make me mad or else my fury is going to go out like a fire that will burn up everything and you won't be able to put it out. You know, uh, when I thought about this, this, this verse, what came to mind is when you have a grease fire, you cannot put it out with water because what happens if you spray down a grease fire with water, it's just going to spread because the grease rides on top of the water. And so if you ever seen a video or you, you know, God forbid you see it in real life, if there's a, some sort of grease fire or a chemical fire where the fire you know, so the, the liquid is on fire and you try to spray it with water. Sometimes it'll just spread. And so what God was saying that, that if you don't institute justice, my fury is going to go out like a fire and it'll burn up any, everything and you won't be able to put it out. And so God gave them two, over 200 years of warnings. And as we look at that, how many years of warning have we had? How many years of warning have we had as nations? God has had preachers, there's some places, there's churches on almost every corner. And so we're not, um, there are people out there that are called prophets, considered prophets, but every person that gets up in a pulpit and preaches the word of God is consider, can be considered a prophet. Because the, uh, the prophet Joel said, uh, according to the word of the Lord, as God speaking, saying, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So what was he saying? Back in those days, it was mostly just men that were considered the prophets. But nowadays, anybody that preaches, God can put the spirit of prophecy on them. Uh, I was talking with evangelists yesterday on Facebook, and we were talking about 
how that some of the messages that we spoke about or we preached on, we're not considered prophets, but God had already basically was telling the church to get ready. You know, uh, 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 once uh, Sister Evangelist was talking about in the state of emergency. And, and there was a, a message that the Lord allowed me to preach called It's Midnight. And so God has already prepared us. God has already given us warning, but he's given us warning for years. Now, verse 13 and 14, it says, Behold, I am against thee, O inhabitant of the valley and rock of the plain, saith the Lord, which say, Who shall come down against us, or who shall enter into our habitations? But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doings, saith the Lord, and I will kindle a fire in the forest thereof, and it shall devour all things round about it. Now, notice here that God does not even address them by a part, particular name. But basically, he's saying, all y'all that live up there and all of you that live down there, <laughs> I'm against you. <laughs> so he doesn't even give them, he doesn't even address them by any particular name. They, they took the security of the location, of, uh, they took security in the location of the city, you know, that, that it was strategically set up, but the judgment and destruction was already made certain by God. And so as we look at the beginning verses where he talks about where he gives them the way of life and death, he said, I'm, I'm setting before you two options, life or death. He said, if you stay in the city, you're going to die. But if you go out there, you're going to be, you're going to live. He said, if you stay here, you're going to die either by sword, by sword, pestilence, or famine. And so here they were taking security of the city, but God was saying, where if you live up in the suburbs or if you live down in downtown, it don't matter where you live, you're about to suffer the judgment. So God was going to punish them according to the fruit of their doing. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8, this people draw up nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So people, the people, they made a mistake. They took solace in what they had. They even took solace in who they were. You know, they, they were basically saying, man, y'all better recognize we're the people of God. God brought us out of, out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. He opened up the Red Sea. He, he, he led us into the promised land. Yes, yes, yes. They had all those blessings. And so they even had sort of a, a cockiness to them. But And even though they still worshiped God, they had the oracles of God, they still held the feast days, all of these things, but yet their hearts were far from God. They were going through a ritual. They were going through a routine, but God was not real in their hearts. So, you know, we make a mistake sometimes of giving God a praise on a Sunday morning, but then when we get to work on a Monday, we're opposite of that which we were just the day before you know so um, go, going into a building to give God a praise once a week is not enough to say that we are Christians we have to do more we have to be more than that you know we can't say well if my good outweighs my bad then I did good we're always to seek to do good but it's not by our works it's by faith in the word of God in the in the in God himself you know, talk, talk is cheap and actions speak louder than words. We've heard that many times. So God was going to start a fire that they could not put out. The whole city was going to be destroyed. Now, you know, Jerusalem wasn't just you no know, fly by night city. It, it, this had been years upon years. We had talked about the Temple of Solomon, how, you know, how great that thing was. But God was going to say, all of this, all this that you glory in, all the, the walls all around it, they were, they were satisfied with their security. Oh, oh, we're good, man. You know, even though Babylon was outside, no, we're good. We're just going to stay here. We're going to eat the food that we have. We're going to, you know, live off the land, live off the crops and everything. God said, no, all of this is going gonna, is gonna to be destroyed. My fire, my, my wrath is like a fire that's not going to be put out. So as we look at what's going on today, as, as nations, we boast about our countries. We boast, oh, look how beautiful it is. Look at the sustenance. Look at the bounty. And so we take uh, solace in those things. We take comfort in those things. And there are times we make statements like, oh, ain't nobody better than us. 
when we make those statements, we have to realize where our, our blessings come from. You know, there were times that Israel went out to fight. They had the better trained army. Israel did. They had the better trained um, uh, archers, so to speak. Um, but they lost. They lost to, there was a nation called Ai. If you look it up, uh, it's spelled A, literally A and I. Um, they went out to fight Ai and Ai whooped them <laughs> because what? God was not with them. And so if God is not with you, it doesn't matter how big your military is. If God is not with you, it doesn't matter how great your economy is. When, you know, and I've shared before that uh, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So it doesn't matter who you are. God still requires you to do right. So right now a reset has come. God has brought everything low. And what can we as people do? We can't do anything. All we can do is ride it out until God says, okay, enough is enough. So the people of Judah got comfortable with injustice going on. You know, they trusted in their nation and even in God, but they did not know that God was not with them, that he was actually against them. So my question is, you know, ask yourself, did we as a nation get to that point? A lot of us can say yes. You know, we took prayers out of school. We've instituted laws that destroy human life. We've put uh, policies into practice that continuously take care, uh, take rather take advantage of poor people, uh, of people that are less fortunate. You know, uh, we, we like to continually punish people. And so when we look at interest rates. People that are let that have the least income pay the highest interest rates. And so when we look at Things like that, you know, people can say, well, it's justified because these people are more at risk. God wants us to be merciful. God wants us to do the right thing. God wants us to implement justice. Judges chapter 16, verse 20 says, and she says, it's talking about um, Delilah, the story of Samson and Delilah. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. That word wished means he knew not. So Samson, you know, Samson was basically like a person that's religious. He went out there and he says, uh, I'm going to shake myself at other times. I'm going to hype myself up. And that's where uh, his strength came from. God gave him a supernatural strength. And so the strength did not come from him lifting weights. A lot of times people picture Samson as a man that was a weightlifter and he had these big muscles. Samson looked just like, I believe he looked like just like a regular man because it said that when the spirit of God moved on him, then he can do these miraculous things. And so he said, I'm going to go out, I'm going to shake myself as at other times. But he did not know that God had departed. So, so if Samson was a weightlifter, he was naturally strong. How was he not able to overtake these Philistines this time? Because it wasn't in his physical strength. It was through the spirit of God, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. That's what God has said. And so as we look at our situation, we, we've said, oh, they stopped me from going out and doing this. It is God that gives us the power to obtain wealth. It is God that gives us the ability and the use of our limbs. So all glory and honor goes to God. Samson, he said, I'm going to shake myself just like other times. You know, we may say, oh, I'm just going to go to church like I did other times. I'm going to jump. I'm going to shout. I'm going to dance. But yet the things that Samson were doing were contrary to the will of God. Same thing happened in this. The people of Jerusalem, they worshiped God. They carried out feast days, but they did not know that God was actually against them. And so the title of this lesson was practice justice. Practice justice. So as we relate this lesson to our lives, what can we learn? What can we learn about this? That um, no matter what the situation is, we have to do right. No matter what the situation is, we have to follow the word of God. And so it doesn't matter if you're a politician. It doesn't matter if you're a civil servant, whoever you are. We have to follow the will and the word of God. So Praise God. That concludes our lesson for today. There are other times that I kind of went over time. And so um, we're going to get out a little early today, but we just want to thank you for tuning in. Um, there are a few ways um, we ask you to give, to donate to this ministry. Uh, 
you can give on Cash App as dollar sign the rim, dollar sign the rim, and you can also go to www.rehovasinternational.org. You can also give there. You can find us on Sun, uh, on YouTube if you've missed any lessons or you want to go back and check a couple of lessons out. We're on YouTube as Rehova Sunday School. So please look at those videos when you get a chance and subscribe so that way um, you can have, if you know, if you miss a Facebook Live or whatever the case, you can go on there and find the lesson. So by the grace of God, next week, uh, we will be in Jeremiah chapter two, 22, covering verses 1 through 10. So at this time, we're going to pray and dismiss. Loving God, we're thankful for your word that was shared today, God. I pray that you would touch each and every one of our hearts, God. Touch our bodies, God. Increase our health, God. Increase our strength, God, Lord. Lord, the one that's nearest hell today, God, I pray that you would touch their hearts, oh God. Lord, allow them to come to you in a reality, Lord God. Forgive us of our sins, God. Lord, enlighten our hearts, enlighten our eyes, God, that we may see you, Lord God, in a reality, Lord. We pray that you will be with each one, God. Encourage each one by your word and by your spirit. We want to give you all the glory, all the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So thank you, people of God. Stay tuned. At 10.30 a.m., we're Hope Within the National Ministries. We'll be on Facebook Live for the Gospel Morning Worship Service. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself in the Word of God. You know, don't look at the news all the time. Give yourself a break from that. Encourage yourself in the Word of God. There are tons of ministries on Facebook that you can tune in. I've been tuning in to prayer meetings. I've been tuning in to services, Bible studies, and I've been allowing the Word of God to encourage me. So I'm not a person that's, you know, I'm not uh, the most outside, exciting, cheerleading person, but I'm encouraged because I've been constantly feeding myself the word of God. And the same thing can happen to you, but you just got to remember what you're doing. You got to feast upon the word of God. So God bless you and have a good day.